Hey everyone, Rund here. And Ramti. And today, we've got something very special for you. We teamed up with Radiolab, one of our favorite shows, to bring you their episode, Worst Year Ever. I really love this episode and wanted to share it with all of you because at its core, the story is about hope. It transports us to another time and place where things are very difficult for humanity and deals with all the philosophical questions that come from that. But before we play it for you, here's a little chat Rund and I had with Radio Lab hosts Lulu Miller and Latif Nasser. Hi. Hi, Lulu. Hi, Latif. Hi, Ramtin. Hi. <laughs> I'm so excited for this conversation. I'm Rund. I think we've all, we all, we all kind of know each other, so... We know each other, sure. Yeah, I'm Ramti, one of the co-hosts of the show, too. Okay, and on our side, so I'm Latif, uh, I'm one of the co-hosts of Radio Lab. I'm also, like, I'm also, like, I'm a, I'm a history nerd. I'm, like, a deep history nerd. I went to grad school and studied history. I, I love history, and I love your show. Uh, that's anyway. Well, we love your show. So this is, um, yeah, this is why perfect. we're here. I didn't know that though. I didn't know you went to grad school. Oh, for yeah. history. oh, he is history. If you pitch, if you put anything on a pitch doc about like an obscure, amazing history that has blown you away, he's like, yeah, well, I wrote a paper about that. And someone here is great. You could talk to is so and so. Um, I am also a longtime through line fan. First time caller, Lulu Miller, also a co-host of Radio Lab, uh, with, the distinct honor of like, I sat next to Ramtin as he was mm. just, he was like, I feel like you were making the musician to radio reporter transition. And there yes. was like, you were producing and cutting tape maybe for Ted Radio Hour or maybe something else. Yeah. And, and how I built this. Yeah. And you had yeah. a big sparkle in your eye and you were always like, but can I write you guys original music? But can I pitch you a story? Yeah. And uh, you were just in this like, uh, you just like <laughs> e e emanated electricity and uh, like literal and metaphoric. And and I think I got to like hear some early through lines when you guys were just starting. Uh, and it did. sounded so... Good. And then it's just now it's like your fifth birthday, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And now it's just you're just powerhouses. And oh. I, mm -hmm. I don't know. I love being a listener. Yeah. I, I want you I want you both to know like Radio Lab was hugely influential on us. Like, I don't know how to I, we can't really overstate how influential it was because it just expanded the like creative parts of our mind in terms of what because we we're movie buffs. We love like, you know, like dissecting uh you know film and uh, you know tv shows and all that and and it made us believe we can translate that into a podcast form so i mean honestly like so much of the sound of the show was initially like inspired by what we were hearing from you all hmm. yeah it was like why can't we do it like a radio lab for history yeah you know it actually makes me think about like the evolution that Radio Lab's gone through, right, over mm. time. And the fact that, like, since you, I think since you all have taken over, it's, like, hit new notes that it, it didn't before. And I wonder, like, how has the show, in, for your mind, in terms of the DNA of the show, changed, I think, since, especially in the last, like, let's say, couple of years since you all have been at the helm? Well, you know, you know, one of the things I think that Latif and I both, are bringing so since 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 Jad, trusty creator of of Radio Lab and OG host Jad, and then Robert Cole, which they both kind of after twenty years decided to move on and do other things, um, and, and <laughs> foolishly handed over the heist, the host chairs to me and Latif here. So one of the main things in the DNA is don't break it. But then the next thing is is also I mean I think Latif and I have a very authentic desire to return to science mm -hmm. um, and not completely. I mean, Radiolab forever will be about curiosity and taking that wherever it goes. But um, I do think that in some of the the later years of, of Jad's time kind of steering the ship, there was, you know, he created more perfect. There was like a turn to the law and all kinds, you know, country music, bless the Dolly Parton stuff. But there was, I think, a desire to bust away from science for a little bit. And I think Latif and I um, 
are authentically in love with science, but I think we're also rethinking expertise and what science means or who you go to as a scientist. So I don't think it's like returning to OG Radiolab necessarily. Um, but I do think there's a slight, I think that we pull it back to science. I think we both do that in different ways. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to use that as a transition though, to start gushing about your show. If you'd like me to do that. Um, if you'd like us to do that. that. (laughs) Uh, okay, great. Okay, great. Um, uh, perfunctory resistance register. Um, uh, okay. So here's why I love your show. It's literally the thesis is in the title, but you also do it um, in every episode is like you'll find a thing and it could be a really big, profound thing uh, or it could be like one of my favorite episodes you all did was the tipping episode, like a seemingly very trivial thing. But sometimes it's a really big thing. Like one of my other favorites was the Sea People's episode. Um, and that's like <laughs> that a big so thing. Good. That's like I'm a thing about that one now, cl- like climate refugees. So like it's like a, a small thing or a big thing in our world right now that all of us feel like we've been like uh, facing this new problem for five minutes. And, and even the way that a lot of the media covers it, it's like, this is the biggest thing ever. Like we use every kind of um hyperbolic language to make it feel like this moment we're so present centric like that's literally what the news is about and then your podcast comes in and is like no actually there's this this is something we've been grappling with for a really long time um tipping is like i don't know why that's like the perfect example to me because that's a thing that like nobody thinks about the sort of prehistory of um except you all and that's why it's so great it's like it's 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 refreshing it makes you feel small but it also makes you feel big that's kind of amazing thank you i i want to say that and i'm not trying to deflect here i mean it i think it makes me think about there's a radio lab episode that rund and i remember both talked about probably endlessly for uh, a couple months called the queen of dying Mm -hmm. the one about grieving and that to me is like an episode like we would have like dreamed of making, right? It has the same, it achieves the same goal that we try to achieve, where you're telling a story of someone who has done something in the past or a process that's occurred in the past that now kind of shapes the way we do that thing now, right? Whether it's tipping or grieving. And I think to me, that's the magic of any of, of the form of, the, of storytelling. It's what we are inspired by, by Radio Lab, and we try to shoot for is bringing things from the past and making them feel present, making them feel real and making us all feel that kind of connectivity and maybe a little like a little less lonely, like a hard hope. Cause that's often what I feel after I listen to radio lab episode, I feel like a little less lonely. Like that, that hole in the, my heart that we all have, that hole in our being is filled a little bit more. And I like, I just, I, I think that's the goal of what we do every single episode we try to do. And I think that's what you all do it too. I think it's also really interesting, Latif, that you bring up, you know, that that episode, um, the 1177, I think we call it what happened after the year after yeah, yeah. civilization collapsed. And then, yeah. like, you know, the 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 episode that we're that we're going to be playing, like it has a lot of interesting parallels, right, with that episode. The yeah, the one the title of, of the episode we're going to be playing from you all is called Worst Year Ever, um, which yeah. which like for a lot of people, right? <laughs> Worst year ever. Best title ever. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, it is. Sorry. It is. I also the the emphasis, the periods. It's, it's chef's kiss. But but no, like I, I I think that's like a perfect example of the sort of like kindred spirits of our shows. Totally. Um, you know. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Everyone else is talking about every other possible thing. Nobody yeah. else is covering the like. 10th century or or whatever it is i feel like yeah. we're right. we're like yeah we're like we're like the lonely weirdos we're like yeah. oh yeah no that is that i i see all you reporters in that press scrum over there like talking to something talking about something really consequential and and now um and we're just gonna we're gonna time travel back to a time when yeah yeah and i guess i mean the other thing i'll just add on there is like and then what you guys add it isn't just it isn't just like Fun fact or neat that's ephemera. Right. Like, that's right. I think what I actually get in a way that surprises me is is emotion. Like I, I mean, I there's often like a subtext uh, to your reporting that I feel like um, 
can can let people also look into the future or empower them to think about mm. new ways through a stuck situation. But it is a similar, like the scrum of reporters are over here reporting on this thing. And you're like, well, let me tell you why this story from 1949 in China has something to do with today. Um, so it's very artful, I think, often what, what you guys are choosing to listen to. And that's why I love to listen because I'm like, what are they going to teach me right now? Mm. Well, I think what... Uh the similar and part of the reason we wanted to run a worst year ever. Can you say it, it? But does... can you say it like worst year ever? Because <laughs> that, that is not required. That is not <laughs> required. That is not think, required. No, well, like, I, I really picture it with vocal fail fry. Miserably Those periods at that. in there are just like, wow. <laughs> okay. You don't have to. Uh, I, no. <laughs> Logif doesn't require it, but I endorse it. <laughs> that should have, uh, you should have used that in the episode. Actually, no, you know, actually that episode is like sneaky has really fire music and sound design mm. right it's like a conversation but the tasteful restraint that's used in it is that's one reason that we really like it the other thing is what worst year ever to me it's all it's the what's the magic of it is the thought experiment of it right the just the very question of like when you're in the worst year ever do you know you're in the worst year <laughs> ever right right or something you said at the end lulu which was like this makes me want to just like go out and and look at my shadow like the appreciation for what we have in this moment and i think those are the things that make uh for me at least like the kind of thing we do is by telling these stories that's what makes them emotional and it made me think, like, are we living the worst year? Like, are we living in the worst year ever now? When do we ever know? And that's just, that way of thinking about things systemically, it makes me somehow weirdly feel like it's like reassuring in a weird way that I'm just like part of this big thing that's happening that I can do all I can in my own life, but ultimately, like, I'm I'm lo- both lucky and maybe perhaps unfortunate to be a part of like these larger forces at work every single day in a weird way, focusing, and I know this is something for us that comes up, like optimism, pessimism are very tricky words for us. And we always are like, what is our kind of goal? Our goal is not to like depress or uplift, right? It's to sort of take you on a journey and make you think about something differently. And I mean, I'll say for myself, like in this moment where, you know, it, it, it is, it's a hard moment. And I think what I take away from it is also that things have been bad and things are capable of changing. Like that history is not stagnant. It never stays super good or super bad or super bad in a specific way um, Mm -hmm. for long, right? And (laughs) just changing super bads. It's just. (laughs) No, I mean, sometimes it goes bad to bad. But sometimes it goes bad to good. And, And I think like that ebb and flow is. Again, it's like I, I I don't even like to think in terms of optimism, optimism, pessimism. I think more in terms of this is the nature of the world. This is what it means to be a human. I think that's like what we're all kind of striving to do a little bit better, I think, on our shows is just to like understand the condition of like existing in this really weird, really complicated world and hopefully extend that to like the people listening, right? And I don't know. There's some, like Ramthi said, there's like some solace in that, even when it is like really you know, when it's a dark time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Rucker Bregman was a historian, is a historian who was on our show. And he said something that always stuck with me, which he, he said, the study of history is the most subversive mm. uh, area of study because it teaches us things can be mm. different. Hmm. It proves to us things can be different and it's kind of up to us to change them. So now, without further ado, here's Radio Lab's episode, Worst Year Ever. Oh, wait, you're listening. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. <clears throat> you're listening, listening to Radio Lab. Radio Lab. From WNYC. See? See? Yep. <laughs> hey. I'm Latif Nasser. This is Radio Lab. I'm getting all settled. Okay. Mm. And to kick off this new year, our very first episode of 2022, Jad and Lulu and I were supposed to have a conversation so, okay. about what our favorite things were from the last year, like books and movies, that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Let's do it. But I have brought you both here with a ruse. Uh, I mean, we may do favorite things, but that's not what I'm prepared to do today. Wait, so, th- so that was that was a fake I prepared my favorite thing. I'm hijacking you both. Ooh. <laughs> okay. Okay, you ready? Yeah. yeah. Very. So uh, we are starting a new year. 
it feels kind of like the last two sort of blur together. And I'm constantly thinking like, which was worse, 2020 or 2021? But then that took me to a different place, which is like, what was the worst year ever? Mm. Not in recent memory, but in human history. Like, was there an objectively worst year to be a person alive on planet Earth? My, my mind goes to uh, parameter questions. Yeah. Okay, great. When is the boundaries? So maybe let's say the worst year in recorded history. Got mm. it. And then worst, do you have like an operating definition for that? Uh, maybe something that like that hit a lot of people in okay. a way that if we were alive then we and we had a choice between living then and living now, we would say, yes, please, 2020 or 2021, mm. please. <laughs> Your sick, sick mind, Latif. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I admit it's kind of a dark thought to have, but I was thinking about it in a kind of positive way. Like the worst year in human history— if I can pin that down, I'll at least know that, you know, 2022 is almost certainly not going to be as bad as that. And then I'll feel better about that. And like whatever's ahead. And whatever's ahead. Okay. <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> Sorry. Um, so fully embracing the suck that is 2020 and 2021, what year would you pit up against it to say this is a worthy adversary? I was thinking Pompeii. The Black Death. Yeah, that's got to be top five. At least if you're like, if you're just going to focus on Europe, You could do five. 1939. Crusades, this, wasn't that the 12th century? Crusades. 1781. Mongolian invasion. Mm-hmm. Which was actually, there are some really good things that came out of it. So, so <laughs> I, you know, hmm. I mean, you could say like 1492 from the American perspective. Yes, yes. I recently came across this thing that in 1100 AD, the moon disappeared for a lot of the year. It disappeared. Mm. So I think that would be hmm. terrifying as either someone who is spiritual mm -hmm. or isn't. Yeah, this is very interesting because you're bringing up a lot of stuff that I'm going to bring okay. up too. But, yeah. so, okay, so the year, the year that I th I think, I want to make a case that this is the worst year in human history um, is 536 AD. 536. Whoa. Okay. All right, what's happening wow, in the world yeah. in 536? Okay, so just a quick picture of what the world looked like around the 530s few hundred million humans on planet Earth or thereabouts. The Roman Empire, you know, fully flowered. Then it fractured into two. Similar thing had happened in China. It also fractured. It is the classic period of the Mayan civilization in Central America. So these are like societies. Like, these are real societies, uh, you know, with major cities and sewage systems yeah. and, and music scenes and stuff like that. Like, it's like, we're not quite in the modern world, but we're in, like, in a world we recognize. Okay, so toilets and toilets and loots. Basically, yeah. Um, okay, so what happens in 536 is not particularly clear. Uh, the leading theory is a volcanic eruption. Hmm. So is this um, a singular eruption or is it a string of them? Almost certainly a string of them, but but at least one of them was enormous. Unclear where this eruption happened exactly, but spewed out ash and sulfates and even tiny bits of glass into the stratosphere wow. uh, where it circulated around the Earth. But there's there's actually... There's another thing that happened. There's kind of an extra twist, uh, which is that I spoke to this one scholar, and what she thinks happened uh, was that a few years prior, Halley's Comet passed by Earth um, and basically whipped us with its tail. And so the debris from that tail entered our atmosphere, broke up uh, in, the, in the night sky, and, and you could actually see it twinkling. Can you imagine if they if it if the two th things were separate events but happened on the same day? Can you <laughs> that would be crazy. That? <laughs> that would be amazing. And and or it wow. could have been something completely different that triggered all of this. Uh, but this is like best best guesses. Um, so whether it was the volcanic sort of plume or whether it was the comet like debris, it creates this thing they call a dust veil over the Earth, 
And that triggers other strange regional weather patterns, including dust storms, which cause even more dust. So in in November and December of 536 in the Chinese city of Nanjing, there's a a report uh, from the city that said, quote, yellow dust rained down like snow. It could be scooped up in handfuls. Wow. And that lasts from February 536 to June 537. So uh, a year and a half, basically a solid winter. Oh, Um, that's that's Game of Thrones shit right there. (laughs) Yeah, it's basically the coldest decade in the last 2,000 years. And that triggers, uh, like, massive crop failures and, you know, mass famine. So in Ireland in 536 and then also in 539, it's written in their annals that they have a, quote, failure of bread. Mm-hmm. Uh, similar food shortages are documented in Korea, Japan. In China, it gets so bad by the 540s that in one area north of the Yellow River, seven or eight out of every 10 people died. Wow, and because God. the crops had failed, allegedly, survivors were forced to eat the corpses of the no. dead. Oh, my no. God. One of the places— where this hit worst was Scandinavia. 75% of the villages that they excavate from around that time, like you can tell that they were abandoned. Basically, it's like all these Nordic people are like, screw it, we're getting out of here. And then they get on their boats and then they like travel around the world and they, wow. it's like- all, all you need now is like an alien invasion <laughs> and I don't know. Well, there's, I mean, there is more. Uh, another issue with this massive dust veil that some people have speculated about is, like, people were not getting a lot of sunlight, so they're not creating vitamin D in their bodies. And vitamin D, among other things, helps boost your immune system to fight bacterial infections. And also, you can imagine, there are all these farms and fields with crops. The plants are dying. The rats in the field and the other animals that are living out there start coming to where the people have, you know, stores of grain or rice or whatever, and that's near where people are living. So now you have people who are hungry. Weaker immune system. Possibly immune, sort of compromised, um, meeting these filthy, desperate animals like rats who are carrying microscopic friends. So I'll let you guess what happens next. God. A plague, all kinds of sicknesses. All kinds of sicknesses, yes, but especially one. So they call it Justinian's Plague. This is uh, 541, so five years later. Um, This plague spreads basically across all of Europe. Uh, It's commonly estimated to have killed tens of millions of people. I'm trying to sort of construct a composite reality from Mm. all of these things. I mean, it must have been cold as hell. There's rats and bacteria. yeah. Uh, so, so these two geoscientists, Stuthers and Rapino, Rampino, they basically like comb through all of like anything written around that time all over the world to try to find like did any, who talked about this and what did they say. Um, mm-hmm. And here's some of what they found. So this is a guy from Italy, statesman type person, uh, Cassiodorus Senator. He says, <clears throat> the sun seems to have lost its wanted light and appears of a bluish color. Hmm. We marvel to see no shadows of our bodies at noon. The moon, too, even when its orb is full, is empty of its natural splendor. (gasps) We've had a spring without mildness and a summer without heat. Wow. That is bad. Yeah, that's bad. Really. And so vivid. The loss of the shadows. Like, you feel the cold. Yeah. yeah. There, here's 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 another one that's like it's equally vivid, I think. So this is Mesopotamia. So this is around the area where Syria is now. A guy named uh, Zacharias of Mytilene, probably pronouncing that wrong, um, quote, The winter was a severe one, so much so that from the large and unwanted quantity of snow, the birds perished. There was distress among men from the evil things. Oh, my gosh. Um, what do you wow. think the evil things means there? I don't know. I, I just left that in there because I did not know what that meant. Uh, and I was like, yeah. ooh, that's really dark and sinister. Um, yeah. Wow. So but everybody, the entire globe is suffering through a 15-month winter. Unclear if it's the whole globe, but much of the northern hemisphere for sure. But in Mayan history, 
uh, there's this period. So this is the classic period of, of Mayan history. Then there's this little mini period that they call the classic period hiatus. Um, and mm-hmm. they have the Mayan people would make these special decorative stone pillars to like mark history and what is going on in history at that time. Basically, they just pause making them. Uh, what do you think? The OK, we kind of talked about what it felt like temperature wise. But like, yeah. what do you think the world sounded like mm. during these years or this year? Well, I guess with the with the birds dying, uh, probably quieter. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but what's left is, I don't know, I imagine like walking on dried grass, like that kind of sound yeah. maybe. Like, you know, the little scurrying of the rat feet over the fallow field or whatever. Um, and then wind probably picks up if you don't have trees, lush plants to break it, right? So you probably get like... Do you know what I keep thinking about is any singular human in this moment would be thinking about their own sorry state and their family and maybe their village. Mm -hmm. But that would be the sort of circumference of their awareness. They had no big picture. So like... I doubt anybody had the big picture of it. Right. Mm -hmm. But I mean, we can see that it was a global catastrophe. And we see that about our own moment in a way that they couldn't. So I wonder if it would have felt like the worst year ever. Mm. So it's funny to think that like the awareness of the whole magnifies the the misery. And like Or the awareness of the whole maybe makes you feel less lonely about it. Like yeah, it's not just you. I don't know. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, I wonder yeah, if no. there was someone who just like got on a horse and was like, I'm gonna ride until <laughs> Like I'm out I can, of it. I get the sun back. And yeah, then he just kept riding totally and they never got it back. Out of the cold yeah. and then like never gets there. Yeah. Yeah. I guess what I guess what I keep thinking about suddenly is um given that I'm an old man, I, now it's my sort of inherited birthright to complain about young people. Um, <laughs> there's a, such such a fixation on mental health amongst amongst, you know, kids, right? Yeah. And I think, thank God, that's amazing. But at the same time, I think, wow, your lives are so great. You know what I mean? But then I think does it feel great? Probably doesn't. Like objectively, their lives are so much more comfortable than a life would have been in 536. Right. But maybe by virtue of the expanded awareness that we all carry, things don't feel good. You know, and so I, I yeah. guess that's what I was thinking about. I was like, what if we endured 536 now, right? Like what if a comet and a volcano blew up? Can you imagine yeah. the wall-to-wall CNN and the tweeting and the retweeting and the constant, like, sharing of misery? It must feel like, it would feel like misery amplified in a way that it probably hasn't at any other time. But mm. that, but, but the sharing, yes, there is misery amplified and that. But, like, think about when the Italians made that video for us. Do you remember that? This oh, the little, this little message and in a and, bottle yeah. of, like, Take it seriously. Learn from Mm. us. Stay inside for a couple of weeks. Mm. It felt like that was a moment where the cross-planetary awareness allowed our best sides to try to come out. And the let's work together. And let's work together. And, And like the kind of watching how different leaders approach it and then being able to just look back and see what works and then take strategies and make mistakes and learn and... yeah. The sharing and the solidarity allowed us to way more quickly collaborate. I mean, that, and, yeah, that, I, that is true. But like, okay, like think back to 536, right? Probably most people alive on planet Earth at the time believed that what was happening, the horrors that were befalling them were coming from above. They were an act of God or gods. And then now what's going on, so much of what's going on, it, it feels like it's happening because of us like something we're doing to ourselves and to each other. 
and sort of whether it is or not, like it's like lab leak or China virus or South Africa variant or this person's not wearing a mask or that person's didn't get a booster or whatever it is. And and as much as the solidarity and stuff, like that stuff also gets amplified on Twitter. I don't know. So it's like as much as you have the we're all in this together stuff, you also have the like, it's all it's all it's all this person's fault. Let's scapegoat this person. Yeah, that's true. I don't know. I'm big on the solidarity in the long run, making it better. And it just seems like with all of that, I mean, it's just like I, I'm I, I'm officially stopping bitching about 2020. <laughs> like I, I'm done. <laughs> but does it make okay? Okay, does that that's sort of like that's what I was curious about. Does this just knowing that it, people in 536? I mean, it's like does it make you feel better about the last two years to know that in 536 it was a much worse year? It doesn't make me better so much as it makes me think, oh, like, there are more floors to fall through here. Like, mm. we, we could fall. We have longer to fall. Mm. Like, I, I don't know if that makes me feel better to know that, um, but it definitely makes me not feel worse. <laughs> okay. Okay. Because I'm saving That's the fair. worst feelings for when, if and when it does get worse. That's fair. <laughs> I just wanted to say what I, what you have left me with about yeah. knowing about that year. I just feel grateful I can go see my shadow mm. and like that's what I'm going to take the year <laughs> ahead yeah. that's what I'm going to take into the year ahead is like well <sighs> if I can see my shadow that means there's enough sun to just enjoy the basic warmth <laughs> mm. of that and and there's ground beneath me that is not yeah. lava yeah that's not lava so going into the next year at least we've got shadows and bread and ground to stand on. Yeah. Do you guys remember my question? That was that was last year. I know, no, it's it's old times. Yeah. <laughs> but do you remember what so, I got a little hung up on? Music. Or I just couldn't. You were yeah. excited to see if... So like, before if we leave you, one more thing, like, because after Latif hit us with the horrors of that year, I was left with this question that just kept yeah. eating at me. Um, and so a little while later, I called them both back up to add just one last little postcard from the year 536. Yeah. What was your question specifically? Was it, uh, did, the, did the misery create a new genre or... or, or you know, my question yeah, was really just what was music like then? You know, what kind of music were people making and hearing that would have carried them through? Mm-hmm. What did it actually sound like? So I did a little digging. Hello? And Hello? I found someone who had a pretty interesting answer to that question, at least for one corner of the world. Should I call you... Cantor Seyum no, or Mogus? No, it's uh, Mogus, Mogus. Mogus. So Mogus <laughs> Seyum, he is a cantor in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, lives in Virginia now, but he grew up in Ethiopia. And some of the musical traditions of his church, songs he sings literally every week, Yeah, he says come from right around the 536 time mm-hmm. in what was then the kingdom of Aksum. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Only the music. Only... By the way, by and in the fact, way, he told me know, about uh, one particular guy from uh, the Yared. You know, they, do you know the Yared, the Yared history? Saint yeah. Yared, Yared, who, according to tradition, was the person writing all this music. One thousand uh, six hundred years ago. You know, this coming. You know, this tradition. Now we don't know the extent to which the dust veil of five thirty six affected this area, and there is debate over the historical person Yared. But according to Mogus's tradition, it was right around the year 536 that Yared composed a brand new book of hymns called Mawasit. Yeah. And yeah. what are the songs in that book about? Mawasit. Mawasit is uh, when somebody dies. We sing songs of Mawasit. It's, it's like a book of it's songs for the dead? Yeah. Hmm. Mm. Could could you sing me just a little bit so I could hear? Oh, right now it's okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> ah, 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 ah,
Now again, it's impossible to know exactly how the chronology of these songs line up with the year 536, and also even how much of Yared's story is real or apocryphal. But what does seem likely is that if you were to walk into a church in Ethiopia about 1,500 years ago, and you were mourning someone, this is the kind of music that may be sung to you to honor that loss. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. All right. Thank you very much. I man. appreciate it. Have thank a great, you. I hope, uh, you know, Happy New Year. Not Ethiopian <laughs> New Year, but boring old Gregorian New Year. And you too. Thank okay. you. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. This episode was produced by Simon Adler with sound and music from Simon Adler and Jeremy Bloom. Special thanks to Dallas Abbott, Matthias Nordvig, Joel Gunn, and reporter Ann Gibbons, whose article in Science on 536 got me interested in this in the first place. Thanks also to Daniel Jacob, Kay Chalamet, Jackie Phillips, and McLeet Hadero, who is a fabulous singer-songwriter with a deep connection to St. Yared. I highly recommend you go check out her music. That's McLeet If, by the way, you want to actually hear the conversation that Lulu and Jad and I were supposed to have about our favorite things from last year, uh, well, that is actually going up right after this to our lab uh, members-only feed. The lab. And it's a fun conversation. I was so excited to share my my little finds of the year with you. So if you do want to hear it, just join the lab head over to radiolab.org slash the lab to sign up. Check it out. See if it's for you. Radiolab.org slash the lab. Thank you for listening. This is Radiolab. More light, non-catastrophic stories coming up from us soon and all through the next year, whatever it may bring. Hi, this is Lauren Bartram calling from San Diego, California. Radio Lab is supported in part by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, enhancing public understanding of science and technology in the modern world. More information about Sloan at www.sloan.org. Science reporting on Radio Lab is supported in part by Science Sandbox, a Simons Foundation initiative dedicated to engaging everyone with the process of science. Radio Lab was created by Jad Boomerod and is edited by Soren Wheeler. Lulu Miller and Latif Nasser are our co-hosts. Susie Lechtenberg is our executive producer. And Dylan Keefe is our director of sound design. Our staff includes Simon Adler, Jeremy Bloom, Becca Bressler, Rachel Cusick, W. Harry Fortuna, David Gable, Maria Paz Gutierrez, Sindunyana Sambandam, Matt Kilty, Annie McEwen, Alex Neeson, Sara Kari, Ariane Wack, Pat Walters, and Molly Webster. With help from Tanya Chavla and Sarah Sonbach, Our fact checkers are Diane Kelly, Emily Krieger, and Adam Chabelle.